Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that the American flag has endured in its many forms as the ultimate symbol of freedom, justice, and the American way. But did you know that our nation's flag was designed by a high school student from Ohio? According to legend, the original American flag from 1776 was sewn by a lady named Betsy Ross. It had 13 stars in a circle representing America's original 13 states. As more states joined the Union, people kept adding more stars to the flag. So by 1958, the U.S. flag had a total of 48 stars for the 48 states of that time. Which brings us to our high school student, Robert Heft. Robert's history teacher gave his students an open-ended assignment. Make a project illustrating your interest in American history. It could be anything. So Robert, who was jazzed about hearing that Alaska and Hawaii were going to become states, cut up an old 48-state flag in his grandparents' basement and designed his own vision for a 50-state flag. When he turned in his final assignment, Robert's teacher said, Anyone can make a flag, and it's got the wrong number of stars. The grade came back a B minus. Robert tried to explain his idea to his teacher, who replied, I'll change your grade when your flag is accepted by the US Congress. Game on. Robert wrote 21 letters and called the White House 18 times until one day in 1960, Robert's phone rang. Hello? Hello, Robert Heff? It was President Eisenhower with news that Robert's 50-state flag design had actually been chosen as the new official flag of the United States. The president invited Robert to Washington where he saw his American flag fly for the first time on July 4th, 1960. Since then, Robert's 50-state flag has remained unmatched as the quintessential symbol of America. But I know what you're thinking. Whatever happened to that B-? Robert's teacher honored his promise and changed the grade to an A. Our founding fathers were booze hounds. So much so that Benjamin Franklin published a dictionary of 228 words that all describe one thing, being blind drunk in the 13 colonies. We love to drink. Colonial Americans were perpetually bombed, especially since water wasn't always clean and accessible. Oh, gross. Many of our nation's most respected men could be found with a glass or two in hand. In fact, Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence oh, yes. oh, while drunk on Madeira. George Washington racked up an epic bar tab of over 160 bottles for just 54 delegates. It's on me. And John keep Adams drinking. went on a seven-week binge, drinking. drinking six hours a night with younger congressmen. Drinking. Keep drinking. So Franklin took a stab at his peers and published the terms he overheard at local pubs in the Drinker's Dictionary. Here's what they said. I've got corns in my head. Oh, go eat a pudding bag, Thomas. You're one to talk, Washington. You're as dizzy as a goose. I'm jambled. My goodness, Hamilton, you've got a brass eye today. Well, the king was his cousin. Clearly, gentlemen, you're all wasted. Open up your wallet and you'd expect to find ones, tens, twenties, maybe even a hundo. The last thing you'd ever expect is a Tom, also known as a $2 bill. Here's why. It was 1862. The federal government had just started printing its first paper money. The first and only denominations were the $1 and $2 bills. And keep in mind, at the time, people were making about $15 a month. To pay using a $2 bill was a status symbol only the wealthiest of Americans could afford. And a lot of the time, they used them for under-the-table transactions like political bribes, prostitutes, and gambling. The Tom ultimately got a bad rap and was deemed unnecessary. In 1966, the government took a 10-year hiatus and stopped printing those bad boys. But in 1976, the government gave them another try, this time classing them up a bit, issuing a special bicentennial bill. A little too classy, some would argue. People began hiding them away as collector's items, leading to less bills in circulation. Which brings us to present day. Though rare, Toms are still being printed and there are over a billion in circulation. Most people keep them as keepsakes, though there is a subculture of $2 ambassadors who are set on keeping the Tom alive by using them every chance they get. So the next time you're paying with cash, go ahead, use a Tom.
Every day I turn off onto an old country road. It's about a mile from the president's, but you can see them. And then you get up to them and you stand next to one and you go, man, these things are huge. How many people on earth can say they've got a collection of presidents in their backyard that you can see from space? I know, there's JFK. <laughs> I have 43 presidents and Ronald. These guys weigh approximately 14 to 21,000 pounds. These things are huge, aren't they? They've been here for about three years, <laughs> and through time, they're starting to enjoy being out here. They've got their wildlife. Wow, got a bee's nest. The weeds are growing up. It's amazing. They amaze me. These statues were once a part of a outdoor park. When the original park had closed its doors, I was asked to destroy the presidents and clean the place up. It hit me, I said, I'm not destroying them. I'm gonna figure out something. The feeling I get from them, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, these guys, they still have strength today that they had when they were alive and forming our country. They mean a lot to me. I want to bring them back to a museum where they can be enjoyed by everybody. In southern Pennsylvania, there is a battlefield. A battlefield so important that it is thought to be the turning point of the American Civil War. This is a story about that place. It's also a story about cats. Thousands and thousands of little cats. This is Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And this is her twin sister, Ruth. Hi, I'm Ruth, and we run a museum of dioramas that are made with handmade Civil War cats. Civil War cats. The combination of a childhood love for clay cats and a strong fascination with the American Civil War. It started out as a hobby that we just did as kids putzing around in our bedrooms. That bit of child's play led to a full-fledged museum, which opened in 2013. the two of us discussed how much do we want to emphasize the cat thing because we don't want to come off as cutesy cats. The idea is the stories of the men, not so much the fact that they're cats. They just are cats because they're cats. Incredibly, each of these scenes is to scale. One eighth of an inch equals one foot in cat feet. And so each one of our soldiers represents one soldier who would have been on the field. We'll calculate the numbers that would have been left in the regiment and we'll fill it in with that many cat soldiers. So for example, Little Round Top, we're going to eventually have about 5,000 soldiers on it. Typically one like the angle we figure took us about four and a half years. The um, Little Round Top diorama we figure is more of a five or six year diorama. Oh look at that! <laughs> we really just want to make the Civil War more approachable, I guess, for people, so they can relate to the history and have more of a connection with the men and the women involved. Now that the word of this cat museum's out, all the people who love cats come in, and now not only are they seeing our dioramas and falling in love with the five and a half thousand little furry smiles smiling at them, but they're also learning the stories and suddenly they have an appreciation of Gettysburg and the history just because they came to see the cats. This is the Northern Bald Eagle, an iconic bird that we almost lost for good only a few decades ago. Northern Bald Eagles are the larger of the two subspecies of the Bald Eagle. Their wingspan can reach over seven feet. They are powerful flyers that soar through the air, reaching over 40 miles per hour when gliding. 
They're excellent predators, attacking from above with their long and sharp talons. By the 1960s, their population was decimated, with less than 1,000 left in the wild. Chemicals from pesticides traveled up the food chain, rendering these top predators sterile or unable to lay healthy eggs. Thankfully, after massive regulations were put in place, they have made a near full recovery. Today, loss of suitable habitat is still a threat, as they are very sensitive to human activity. This is the Northern Bald Eagle.